Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to make a very early apology for my croaky voice. It was a, a little bit of a late night last night, as I'm sure it was for a few of you. Um, so an extra special thank you for, for making it to this morning's session. And as Steve has mentioned, what we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about is how the events of particularly the last couple of years with COVID have impacted retail and thus how brands like yourself can deliver products through the market, route to market. And it was really interesting when we were preparing for this, uh, this webinar over the last few weeks, we, we really delved into the detail on, on exactly what had happened through the various points in time over the last year and a half. And you can see here some, some snapshots on exactly what happened and when and how each of those small pieces made a real difference to what was happening in the moment within retail. But the positive news, as we all know, is that there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and actually there's gonna be a return to normal or a new normal from the 19th of July as per Boris Johnson's announcement, announcement at least in the UK. Um, so the interesting bit is how did what was happening with COVID impact shoppers? And there's no real surprise here. You'll all know that the share of online sales almost doubled year on year from Jan 21 versus 2020. But for me, the more important message is that COVID was an accelerator of pre-existing trends. Um, by and large on all trends, be it e-commerce and online sales, like we're talking about here, but also things like retail consolidation and other macro trends that were already in place, albeit changing at a much slower rate up until the point, of course, that COVID hit. So what we're going to talk about for um, what in today's agenda is firstly, what's happening with retailers and, and how are they responding? Who's doing well and who's doing not so well? And then most importantly, what should you do next or even now if you're not already thinking about it? And then finally, I'll share three fundamental considerations. So three things that regardless of who you are and what you sell, you should probably be thinking about and acting on if you aren't already. Let's start with retail. And of course, the question that everybody wants the answer to is the graph I just showed with, you know, online share of sale almost doubling. Is that type of growth going to continue? And um, if you look at independent research sources, what it will tell you is that a lot of people actually still see e-commerce online shopping as a temporary measure until they're able to go back to their pre-existing habits of shopping in stores. But almost all industry experts, and this is very much the JDS opinion, is that online sales will continue to grow, not as fast as we've seen over the last two years. I think we'll probably see that 35, 36% share come back a little bit, particularly now as we move into the new normal from middle of July. But I, we do expect it, and most experts expect it, to be growing at a faster rate than pre go pre-COVID. So we really can't fight the tide when it comes to e-commerce, nor should we want to. So unsurprisingly, when you start to look at how retailers sat within their distinctive channels have performed, it should come as no real surprise that e-tailers, the likes of Amazon, Mercado, Very, AO, et cetera, have done extremely well. Their pre-existing proposition back in January 2020 was perfectly positioned for what happened over the course of the next 18 months. But what's more interesting, I think, is how some of the traditional, if we want to call them that, bricks and mortar retailers have adapted. And um, the likes of Curry's, even B&Q, who have had a pretty torrid time for the last four or five years, have started to see some, some good growth and real acceleration on their, on their digital transformation agenda. And of course, garden centers who, if you remember right back to uh, March last year were quite quickly ruled as essential retail. And I think that really supported that channel and actually has probably brought a new demographic into garden centers. That's possibly one for another time. But unfortunately, there are retailers 
channels, I would say department stores on the whole are really struggling to, um, to really know what they are and what they offer their customers. And of course, we know fashion has taken a, a huge hit over the last couple of years. I know not particularly relevant for most of you, but it's important that we understand what's happening in all of the markets and the adjacent markets to the ones that you operate in. If we take then a deeper dive on some of the standouts for me, where there's some very interesting developments, unsurprisingly, Amazon is, is the first on that list. And Amazon, again, were already performing spectacularly well pre-COVID. And they were just perfectly positioned for um, the forced behavior change that was put on customers on having to shop online for a lot of products where they would have traditionally maybe shopped in stores. What's also interesting and important to know is Amazon is now actually also the third largest advertising platform. So not only are they an, an absolute monster in terms of, of merchant and sales, but they're a, they're a pretty big beast when it comes to advertising as well. And we'll come on to Amazon a little bit later and how a lot of customers now within certain demographics, at least, are going there before they go anywhere else when considering a new product. Secondly is curries, and, and I've got personal experience of this with curries. So I use curries a lot for uh, buying technology equipment for, for JDS, and we were buying quite a lot of equipment actually through lockdown. And curries provided a service where um, you went onto the live chat on their website, and they would do a video call with a store colleague that was in store. The store was shut, but they were in store. And they were able then to walk me through the features and benefits on different products and talk to me about pricing and have you considered these accessories? And what they did really well, Curry's, is bring the reasons customers like to shop in store, you know, try the product, get expert advice. And they brought that through virtual channels. It probably wasn't quite as good as human to human um, or sorry, sort of physical contact, but it was still a really good experience. And again, Curry's were already doing quite well on this digital transformation piece, and they've done particularly well in um, changing over the last couple of years and within the moment being relevant, but also as they look forward now, they're doing a big rebrand and they're really going to put themselves as a website first company or an online first company, sorry. And then the final one, it may be a bit of a curveball, is B&M. And a B&M for me is a fascinating retailer and they don't sell online at all. And they're actually one of the fastest growing retailers. And I think they are the fastest growing garden retailer in the country. And they have been for a number of years. And what B&M demonstrates is that whilst online is growing and um, offline is still very big, still 70, 65, 70 percent of total transactional sales. And actually with the right proposition, that B&M have for their customer, actually they don't need it and they're still delivering great growth. And that really is the message from this first section of the presentation. There's a lot happening with retailers and different channels and performance and how they're changing. But actually for you as a brand, there's not a one size fits all. You shouldn't necessarily sell to B&M and Curry's and Amazon and everybody else that we've talked about. It really very much depends on your business. So that takes us into the second part of this presentation. What should you do now or next? And if you've watched any of my webinars before, you'll know that we use this slide a lot. And we always say the first step of planning is to understand your market or map your market. And that market consists of three things, companies, so yourself and your competitors, the sales channels that products are sold through, so what we're talking about today, and then of course, customers. And what we're really looking to do in the context of today's conversation is as we get a better picture for who are our competitors, which channels are they selling through, who's buying the product, are there different types of customers buying different types of products within the same category, you can start to see, well, are there opportunities for us in online? Because we can see a huge share of sale from some of our competitors going through those channels, but we're not positioned there. That's just as an example. But the first step is to take a step back actually before you go forward. And in the context of route to market and channel management, we're looking for opportunities where you may be under indexed or there's uncontested market space. Secondly, and this is probably most important, is you need to understand how your customer shops your category because it will be different for every category 
And within that category, different customers will shop in different ways. Humans are incredibly irrational. So whilst I can present lovely models and frameworks like this to you, the reality is humans don't always do what as marketers we want them to do. So this is a very simple purchase journey. And what you can see here is the shopping experience broken down into two stages. You've got the first stage, which is the out of market. So I'm not in the market to buy a particular product. Let's say I'm looking to buy some new uh, pots and pans for the kitchen and then something will happen. So I might move home. Uh, I might see an advertisement. Uh, we might have friends coming over or, or uh, family coming over. So we want to make a good impression, but something will happen and that will trigger me to go into market. Right. I need new pots and pans. And then what do I do? You know, do I go straight to, you know, my local independent cook shop? Do I go to John Lewis? Do I go to Amazon? Do I search Google best pots and pans 2021? So what we're really looking at on this slide for today's conversation is this shopper experience. So what's happening when that trigger goes off and how can you put your brand where your customers are? That is really, really important. You know, if a lot of your customer type or your target audience are shopping in curries, hypothetically, for your product category and you're not in there, then that's a problem. So you need to think about how you can put yourself both as they're exploring options and evaluating what type of product they want right through to, right, I want to buy the product now. Are you even an option? You have to be physically available to your customers. That's rule 101 of distribution. You must be physically available. And then finally is having an, a clear business objective. So the first step, map the market. Second step within the first step really is understand your customer and how they shop in, in the context of channel. And then thirdly is right, well, we need to have a plan and that plan has to be led by the business objective. And the reason that I'm sort of pushing this point is because if your business objective is to increase market share, it's to penetrate more customer types, it's to acquire as many new customers as possible, then that would probably drive a different distribution strategy to if your business objective primarily was to increase your margin. So, you know, distribution or channel management is just one tactical element of the bigger, broader commercial strategy mix. It's just one. You've got product and price and marketing communications and all of it sort of put together is, is your brand. But all of it should be, and to be most effective and efficient, led by your business objective. So having a very clear plan, you know, as I said, anchored with what you're trying to achieve, the goal, will really help you decide, right, well, should we be you know, investing money in point of sale in this retailer, or should we actually be scaling back our distribution to manage margins? You know, the example I used a second ago. That said, and I am a big advocate for um, uh, taking a, a proper planning approach and not assuming that you are like your competitors and making sure you do that work where you fully understand your market based on objective data. Actually, there are a few things that almost all brands should be either doing or at least considering quite strongly. And the first of those, unfortunately, you might say is, is Amazon uh, and actually marketplaces more broadly. So the likes of eBay would be in that category. Mano Mano, I know Steve mentioned them in the quarterly updates a couple of weeks ago. Um, but Amazon, as you can see from some of the stats on this slide, um, have done such a great job of providing convenience to customers, which in our opinion at JDS is the new battleground for retailers. It's no longer price, it's about convenience. It's about stock availability, speed of delivery, options of delivery. Amazon are, are really leading the march when it comes to that. And so much so that it's actually a stat not on this slide, but about 60 to 65% of product searches start on Amazon in the UK that is. And, you know, that number would have been the same five years ago, but for Google, you know, Google was always seen by marketeers as the first touch point in shopper journey. Actually, Amazon are, are sort of bypassing that. And what's really important to remember here with, with customers and, and how most customers buy most categories is they're not always looking for the absolute best product. 
in a lot of categories and in a lot of circumstances, customers are just looking for a good enough product, you know, a product that's going to do the job that they need it to do. And Amazon, based on that convenience positioning that you can, you know, one click on an app, search for the product, see the reviews, that can all happen very, very quickly and conveniently. So it's not a dead cert that you should be on Amazon and other marketplaces, but it's quite likely that you should be. And if you already are possibly spending a bit more time and a bit more effort on really optimizing your listings. Secondly is direct to consumer. Um, we do a lot of work at JBS on, on direct to consumer, particularly for brands that are currently retail distributed. So they're currently sold through the likes of B&Q or Curry's or John Lewis or, 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 or you know, the other retailers out there. Um, and we work with them to successfully set up a direct direct to consumer channel and minimize the, um, the potential damage that could be done to existing trade relationships. And that's often the biggest barrier when we speak to, you know, potential new clients, you know, they'll say, we've been thinking about this for a long, long time, but we're so worried that if we do it, we're going to lose our distribution. And whilst it does need to be carefully managed and properly managed, um, I would really avoid that doomsday styled thinking. Um, I've never really seen um, that happen so dramatically. And again, like I said, if the plan is done well and you're proactive with your communication with retail and you support retailers in other ways, which we're going to come on to in a second, then actually it can be a very good, profitable channel for you. Um, and also gives you full control of the customer experience, which is becoming more and more important uh, in, in modern days. So direct to consumer would be something that almost all of you should be doing or thinking about if you're not already. And then finally, of course, is retail. Um, and we're big believers in retail. We believe that physical retail space is still going to play a very important role in lots of categories. Um, it's just thinking about how best to use that retail space. So, you know, retail space always used to be measured on, you know, margin per square foot. Um, you know, how much profit, how many sales can we drive from, you know, every single square foot in a single store? And brands were very much encouraged to support retailers with that target in mind. But for brands now, brands really need to think about stores from both a conversion perspective, but also like a brand awareness and image perspective. And it's been banged on about for a decade now that stores need to change to provide better experience, you know, um, and to be more inspiring. And there's a lot of retailers that just still aren't doing it. There's an example here actually from FMCG, which I think is very good, sort of a gondola end uh, uh, display unit from, from Cadbury's. But how you use that space and work with retailers is, is really, really important. And there's something that we use, a matrix that we use with clients when deciding, well, which retailers, be it in-store um, investment or, or online investment, really should we be working with? And for me, what you really want to break it down into is destination, conversion and impulse. So based on the, the work that you will have done with the market mapping and understanding the customer, for a lot of categories, there are still default retailers that people go to. So for example, if I need paint, I'm probably going to go to a DIY store. If I need a laptop, I'm probably going to go to an electronics store. But if you can really define right, which of those are destination stores and are likely to have customers that are still in the, you know, which product should I buy phase, that could drive some decisions on, well, we need to invest in a good brand presence within those stores. Conversion is very much, well, where, which are the retailers that, you know, are actually just selling lots of product and it's where people go to to ultimately buy. And Amazon's a great example of this. You know, people will go into a retailer, maybe to try the product, to get some advice, and then they'll possibly, even in the store or when they get back home, they'll look for the best price, which is quite often Amazon, and they'll buy there. So what, do you, what should you be investing in your conversion stores? And then, of course, impulse. You know, so is there opportunity through some retailers that you maybe don't work with um, all year round or you don't have branded space in? Is there opportunities to stick your products in front of customers where they might not be expecting it? So big pallet displays at the front of Tesco, for example. Um, where the product and the market and the customer lends itself to impulse and that you're able to drive some additional sales that way. 
But then also on retail, you, you know, if you've got trade marketing teams or you, you've got sort of account management teams that are working with what we call traditional retailers, you really need to be thinking about supporting those both with physical, but also online, because online is effectively your digital shelf. So, you know, uh, there's, there's a few considerations that you, you really need to think about is, you know, just like in a store, if you walk in and if you've got a great display at the front of the store, it's going to be seen by more people that go into the store. It's the same thing in the online world. So, you know, how can you work with your retailers to get a better position or prominence on their websites? You know, how can you, with better content, better videos, 3D animation, AR, use that online to inspire and educate customers to buy? And then finally, what can you do to alleviate potential barriers to purchase where typically people would want to touch and see the product, but actually um, is there things that you can do where you can just convert people online? And a good example of this is what's happening in the automotive industry at the moment. And I saw some, some data I think just earlier this week from, uh, I think it was Bain and Company, I'll double check that, but they were saying that 15% of car purchases um, are now done uh, online, the money transacts online, and that's expected to rise to north of 20, with a lot of customers now saying they'll never even see or test drive the car before they buy it. And that's a market you would traditionally say with distribution dealer, dealers and um, you know having a space where people can touch and try the products first and foremost, is critical. And if it's happening in automotive, it's likely happening in your markets. But retailers still have a lot of traffic. And if you can work with retailers to increase the prominence of your brand and your products on those websites, then again, that could be a good way to drive growth, sales, margin, subject to your business objective. So we've gone through quite a lot there. And, and I've sort of referred you back to um, you know, planning and direct to consumer and frameworks for setting out a commercial strategy. There's a lot of content we have on our website now, um, be it previous beta webinars or articles or sort of frameworks and approaches that we use. So I'd encourage you to, to go there and, and have a look if there's anything of interest that you've heard today. And also, we've actually recently launched a, a newsletter, which is absolutely not designed to sell. So what we do is we provide original content and also referrals to great content and ideas that we see elsewhere. And we send that out exclusively to business leaders once a month. So if you'd like to, to sort of sign up for that and see some of the stuff that's coming out, then would be great. And just go onto our website and uh, this little box will pop up quite quickly where you can enter your email address. But that is it for me today. So again, thank you very much.